This morning we'll uh, continue in our series in uh, Daniel, and uh, before I, I do do that, I do want to just uh, pray, continue to be in prayer for things going on within our world and our country and, and our leaders and all that kind of stuff. I, I think that's an important part of what we are able to do as followers of Jesus, uh, to lift others up in prayer. I know there's a lot of anxious people out there because of school starting and some of the kids have already gone back to college. Some of those colleges have actually already closed and said we're just doing things online. Some haven't done that yet. And so there's just lots of uncertainty out there with lots of things going on. And I do want to be in prayer for uh, those things and those folks that are affected by that at Grace Church and, and everywhere, really. And uh, just use this as an opportunity for you. I'm sure you've brought things on your mind. Uh, maybe stuff going on in your job, maybe uh, with your family, maybe uh, with friends, uh, maybe just lots of anxiety over all that's taking place. Uh, there's people that are watching online that have not been here and really haven't been able to go out very much at all. And so that isolation gets to you after a while as well, so that we are in a, a time in which we do need, as God's people, to be praying together and for each other. And so before we get into Daniel 7 this morning, uh, I want to invite you to be praying where you are uh, silently, and, and I'll pray as well. So let's, let's do that now. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. God, I am thankful uh, for the ability for us to gather here in this place to be led in song, uh, that we can sing together and, and sing these words that uh, oftentimes we just need to remind ourselves of, Lord, and remind ourselves of the fact that your mercies are new every day and you continue each and every day if we seek you out to restore our soul. And I pray, God, that this might be one of those acts of restoration in each person's life this morning, whether they're sitting here in this building or whether they're at home watching, that being a part of this worship service might be a way in which they can restore their soul. God, we're thankful that even those times in which we lose heart, maybe we question, maybe we doubt, Lord God, even in those times, Lord, we're thankful that you continue to be with us. And that you're never far from us. God, forgive us for where we've put ourselves in your place. Where we thought we knew better than you. God, forgive us for where we've sinned against you and cleanse us as David prayed. Purify our hearts, Lord, that we might worship you in spirit and in truth this morning. That we might, for this short amount of time, just... Try and focus our attention, our energies, our mind on you. God, I lift up to you this morning if there's someone here just struggling right now, someone watching via live stream that is struggling either because of isolation and just not being around people. Maybe it's something going on at job. Maybe they lost their job because of things taking place. Maybe it's family members that are struggling or friends. God, I pray for our relationships as well. There's a lot happening within our world that has become very dis divisive. And Lord, I, I pray that we wouldn't lose important relationships in our lives because of those divis divisive things, especially, Lord, as brothers and sisters in Christ. And so, God, I lift up to you our leaders, those who have been given authority by you over us. As we've learned from Daniel, that's what it is. It's your authority that you give to others. And Lord, we pray that they would make righteous decisions, wise decisions as they govern here in this country and really all over the world, Lord, as we are in some difficult and uncharted waters, waters with dealing with a pandemic, Lord. And so, God, we ask that you would be with our leaders be with our local leaders and our state and federal leaders as well, Lord. And God, we pray that they would turn to truth and righteousness and goodness as they make decisions that affect all of our lives. 
God, help us as a church be able to bear witness to who you are in this world through the way in which we live. I'm, as I prayed last week, thankful that we could do that with our teens. Just a short week of serving others as a way to say God hasn't forgotten about this world. We're here in his name to serve. God, may we live that out. And as we hear from Daniel this morning in chapter 7, continue to be reminded, Lord, of your sovereignty, that you continue to rule and to reign, Lord. And may we be open to what that means for us in our everyday life and how we live. And so, God, may your spirit be with me as I share and with each person as they listen. And God, may you use this time in a way that honors you, in a way that helps us to be more like Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. So this morning we're going to kind of shift gears a little bit in that uh, we're going to be talking about dreams that Daniel has had and visions, specifically chapter 7, a dream that he has, visions that he has. Um, We were looking at chapter 1 through 6, which was how Daniel and his buddies kind of lived in this empire. What did it look like to live inside of an empire and still follow God, even though everything within this empire was against God? And so chapter 1 through chapter 6, we kind of looked at all that, and uh, we now are going to be shifting gears a little bit to look at chapter 7 of Daniel's dream. And 7 through 12 is actually all about visions and dreams that Daniel has. And so we, I'm changing the name of the sermon title, even though it's still within the same series of the rise and fall of empires, because that's really what Daniel is getting at in these later chapters, as Daniel kind of brings home the big picture of this whole cosmic thing that is taking place of redemptive history and why that's important. And so we're going to hear some weird stuff that is very unfamiliar to us, that is a lot of symbolism. I'll try and explain a little bit of that, give us a little bit of an understanding of what all that means and what Daniel's trying to say. And then we're going to try and say, well, what does that dream have to do with us here in the 21st century? And so Daniel 7 Uh, is all about a dream that he has, a vision that he has. And Daniel reminds us in Daniel 7, and all throughout Daniel, the same phrase that I've been putting up every single Sunday, because it's important for us to remember this. And as Daniel kind of paints this larger story that's being written here, it's to remind not only Daniel's people in his time, but to remind us. That in spite of our present circumstances that make it appear as if evil is winning the day, which it certainly did in Daniel's day, God will reign supreme and will have the final victory. And Daniel's dream today really drives that home. Now that's supposed to help people in the here and now. How this reality helps us is one of the things I want to kind of draw out in how you and I are called to live in this world that we find ourselves with empires coming and going and and trying to live within all that. And Daniel's dream is going to try and help us to do that. And so Daniel's dream, once again, is all about something we've been talking about. Now, we've pretty much focused, focused on one empire or one kingdom and culture, and that's Babylon. That's been our main focus in chapter 1 through 6. But chapter 7 is doing the exact same thing and how we and how God is over and above all these kings and cultures. And Daniel's going to relay that to us through a dream that he has. Did anybody have a dream last night? All the, all the kids are dreaming about. I don't know what you're dreaming about. Some of you had a dream last night. I didn't have this dream last night. I did dream this this past week. I'm not making this up. I was here doing exactly what I'm doing now. And in my dream, I specifically remember this. I look back at that clock, and it was 11.30. And I was done at 11.30. See, you guys, see, it is a dream, you know? 
dreams can come true sometimes. I'm not sure it's going to come true today, but they do come true. Now, the dream that Daniel has, uh, if you dreamt this stuff, you had some bad salsa or you had something you shouldn't have eaten before bed and, and you've got a wild dream because Daniel's about to dream something pretty outlandish to us. Everything he dreams, all the symbolism, all the imagery would have been recognizable to who Daniel's writing to and pretty much everybody in the ancient Near Eastern world. Dreams were a big thing. We learned about that. Nebuchadnezzar has a dream, and he's got a whole slew of people that interpret that dream for him because they put a lot of emphasis on dreams. They believed that was the language of the gods. They spoke to you through dreams. And so what Daniel's experiencing is not abnormal, and even the stuff he's dreaming about is not weird to him or to uh, the people that would have read Daniel or that would have heard about his dream or that had any of these dreams. The symbolism that happens is consistent with other themes within the Old Testament and really is consistent with ancient Near Eastern culture. And these images of these beasts, these hybrid beasts, these different things, lions that have wings and leopards that have four heads and all kinds of stuff, uh, these, would, these would have been images very familiar to Daniel's day. And so Daniel has this revelation. And we have a, a book in the New Testament called Revelation. And it's apocalyptic literature. Now, if I say the word apocalypse, what comes to mind? Huh? Zombies? Zombie comes... To mind for Jess, anybody else? Apocalypse. What do you think when you hear the word apocalypse? Revelation? Chaos? Maybe like the end of the world? What did you what do you think, Kaylee? Zombies? You and Jess have issues. Usually when we think of apocalypse, we think end of time, end of the world. Chaos. If zombies are here, you can pretty much think it's all over. I mean, that's, I guess that's why you're thinking zombies. I don't know. The actual translation from apocalypto to what we have in Revelation is just that. The word revelation is apocalypse, apocalypto. It's a revelation. It just so happens the book of Revelation is kind of about the end of the world. So we associate the two, but the Greek word actually means revelation. And so that's what Daniel is having. And oftentimes these revelations are supernatural uh, that the authors of Scripture have. It wasn't just John in the book of Revelation in the New Testament. It was Daniel and actually other prophets had these revelations as well. And these revelations are giving Daniel a picture that he wouldn't be able to just derived from his own wisdom, from his own logic, from his own study of history, from rational, critical thinking, analyzing stuff. What he is receiving is something that is from God. And so the themes that are going to be running through this revelation, this apocalypse that he has, this, this vision, is all about clashes of kingdoms and cultures. Now, we've seen that taking place with the God of Israel in Babylon specifically, and a little bit of Persia. And now Daniel's going to see basically how that's going to play out. And while many scholars believe he's talking about four specific kingdoms, you could apply this to just about every empire within human history. And so I'm going to read this for you. And again, understand that these images, there's going to be four beasts that appear. Then we're going to be ushered into this big courtroom scene where God is. And then Daniel's disturbed by this. And so he needs somebody to interpret this for him. And so there's this angelic being within his vision that interprets his dream for him. And we're going to try and unpack a little bit of that dream and then try and say, well, what in the world does all that have to say to 21st century followers of Jesus living in Pennsylvania in Schuylkill County. 
So Daniel 7 begins in the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon. So we ended last week with the story of Belshazzar, who was the king of Babylon. Not as great and as powerful as Nebuchadnezzar, but still Babylon was the empire of the day. Uh, and so Daniel is living within that Babylonian empire. He has this dream. And these visions pass through his mind as he's lying in bed, and he wrote down the substance of his dream. So here it is. Daniel said, In my vision at night I looked, and there before me were the four winds of heaven churning up the great sea. Four great beasts, each different from the others, came up out of the sea. Now maybe that doesn't mean much to all of you, but any time the sea is referenced... In ancient Near Eastern text, whether it's scripture or some other text within the ancient Near Eastern world, the sea represented chaos. The sea is what people thought of before the world began. So if you go look back to Genesis 1.1, and uh, it says the spirit hovered over the, the deep, or it hovered over the chaos that was the imagery being given, the sea. Now, every ancient Near Eastern creation story, ours isn't the only one. There's lots of creation stories. And every one had to do with this chaos that the gods came and brought organization to. Now, the gods of most other pagan religions, they battled that chaos. They fought with swords and fights and people dying and all that kinds of stuff. What we find in Genesis 1-1 is God speaks and brings order to the chaos. And so here we see chaos. And maybe that's not so hard for us to imagine kingdoms and cultures being in chaos. I think we've seen a little bit of that, had a taste a little bit of that throughout our entire planet. As every culture and person is trying to figure out how they handle a pandemic. And so... It begins with a very familiar line in ancient Near Eastern culture about the churning of the great sea. And these four great beasts, each different before me, and the four winds of heaven. So he's kind of like, you know, on the compass, there's four points. He's kind of talking about this is global. This is not just here in Babylon. What he's envisioning has to do with the cosmos, the, the earth, everything. That's what that four winds of heaven is describing. And so here's his dream. Like I said, you ate something bad if you're having a dream like this. So if you had this dream, we should talk after the service. The first was like a lion. So he's talking about these four great beasts. The first was like a lion. It had the wings of an eagle. I watched until its wings were torn off and it was lifted from the ground so that it stood on two feet like a human being. And the mind of a human was given to it. And there before me was a second beast, which looked like a bear. It was raised up on one of its sides, and it had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. And it was told, get up and eat your fill of flesh. And after that, I looked, and there before me was another beast, one that looked like a leopard. And on its back it had four wings, like those of a bird. And this beast had four heads and was given authority to rule. Now, imagine this. Use your imagination. Picturing these beasts. They look pretty ugly to me. Pretty grotesque. After that, in my vision, I looked. In verse 7, I am. And there before me was a fourth beast. Terrifying and frightening and very powerful. It had large iron teeth that crushed and devoured its victims and trampled underfoot whatever was left. It was different from all the former beasts, and it had ten horns. While I was thinking about the horns, there before me was another horn, a little one, which came up among them. And the three of the first horns were uprooted before it. This horn had eyes like the eyes of a human being and a mouth that spoke boastfully. And so here's the image this weird image of these four beasts. Now, remember last week, if you were here or watching at home, we talked about Nebuchadnezzar putting himself in the place of God and God judging him by doing what? 
Nebuchadnezzar became like a what? Huh? A cow. He became like a cow, a beast. He started eating grass. He lost his mind. And it seemed that Daniel was making this connection that when human beings, kings, empires, put themselves in the place of God, they represent beasts more than the royal image that they're called to bear as followers. And so here again, we see this chaos. And, and out of the chaos... These four beasts, ugly, grotesque, hybrids. It's, a, it's not a line, it's a line with other stuff on it. And so the imagery that Daniel's bringing up, once again, you can find this imagery throughout the Old Testament. In places like Isaiah and Ezekiel and Hosea talk about these very same things. And as I said, if you wanted and interested in ancient Eurasian culture, you could read about some of this stuff and what they represent. And so Daniel is actually envisioning, if you can follow the line of thinking here, kings and cultures and these four beasts, people putting themselves in a place of God, empires putting themselves in a place of God, you can probably deduce on your own that these are going to represent kings or empires. And so anytime you hear the word horn, like we just heard at the end there, out of this fourth beast, all these horns popped out of its head. Horn was representative of kings and power. And so Daniel is apparently seeing a series of kings rising and falling. Or a kingdom and kings within that kingdom. And so he is disturbed by this. This is more like a nightmare than anything. He has this vision. He has these four beasts. And now he goes on in verse 9, after he has this horrible vision of these beasts. As I looked, he says, the thrones were set in place, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. Now that is a clear reference, Ancient of Days, to Yahweh, to, to God, the God of Israel. That language is used elsewhere within the Old Testament. And his clothing was white as snow, which is representative of holiness or purity. And his hair of his head was white like wool. And of course, God doesn't have hair. So that's representative of wisdom and knowledge. And his throne was flaming with fire, and its wheels were, were ablaze. A river of fire was flowing, coming out before him. And that's very consistent with how God is portrayed, represented represented in the Old Testament. When Moses met Yahweh, God, he was introduced to him through a, fire, a, bur, a bush that was on fire. When the Jews were wandering in the desert and God was showing them the way, they were led by a pillar of fire at night. Ezekiel talks about God's chariot of fire. Fire is representative of God. And it says in the imagery being, being given here is one of a, a big courtroom. Thousands upon thousands attended him. 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. The court was seated and the books were opened. Often the gods are pictured, not just here in Scripture, but the gods of other people groups are pictured as serving in some kind of court because they have the power. They're judging human beings. They're the ones who are having the seasons turn the way that they're turning. Whether or not it's going to rain and you're actually going to survive depends upon the God of rain and all these people. And they've got this big courtroom and they're deciding how all of this works. And so Daniel is bringing another image of a courtroom. This one being judged by Yahweh. And using imagery very familiar to the Jews who would have been reading this and very familiar in that culture. But verse 11 takes an interesting turn and says, Then I continued to watch because of the boastful words the horn was speaking. Remember that horn that popped out? Boastful words, basically putting themselves in the place of God. I kept looking until the beast was slain and its body destroyed and thrown in the blazing fire. The other beast had been stripped of their authority, but... 
they were allowed to live for a period of time. In my vision at night, I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man, coming with the clouds of heaven. Now only divinity, only God or gods, rode on the clouds of heaven. And specifically in the Old Testament, whenever you hear that phrase, it is referencing God. And yet this person, this one like a son of man, is distinct from, though possessing the very essence of the Ancient of Days, is distinct from the Ancient of Days. He is like a son of man. If we literally translate that in Daniel, that's a human being. Now, where else have you heard that phrase, son of man? Who else has used that phrase? Anybody know? Jesus has. In fact, if you read Matthew, the first book of the New Testament, Jesus will use that phrase over 30 times. That phrase got Jesus in a lot of trouble with the Pharisees and the teachers of the law because that phrase has a lot to do with Daniel chapter 7. And it seems that Jesus was trying to make very clear and specific that he was putting himself in that place. That what Daniel was envisioning was this son of man, this human being, and let's read about him. Coming with the clouds of heaven, he approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. And he was given authority and glory and sovereign power, and all nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominion is everlasting dominion. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away. And his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. Jesus made very clear as he was talking to his disciples and as he referenced himself as a son of man, that he is that one that every knee will bow to and every tongue will confess that he is Lord. That God inaugurated his rule and reign through him. And that this picture Daniel is seeing is God's everlasting rule that with all the rise and falls of these empires, with the next beast on the scene that is slain, and then the next one rises up, there is one who will reign supreme over them all. This one like a son of man who now sits with God beside his throne and rules and judges as God himself. And of course, now us looking back at Daniel can see this is an image of Jesus. That Jesus is this son of man, this human being. That all the kingdoms on earth are given to him and he is in authority over them. I mean, that was one of the temptations that Satan tried to do. They were already given to Jesus, but maybe we can just bypass God's plan. And here you go, Jesus, you can have him now. And Jesus doesn't do it. He knows that God has given him that. But first, he's got to defeat sin and Satan and death. And give them the final blow, which he does on Easter Sunday, which is why we're even here this morning. Because we know who's defeated, who's slain these beasts. So Daniel doesn't know this. So Daniel's probably trying to figure this out. And so Daniel's troubled in spirit as he sees all this, because it's not a great picture right now. And the visions that passed through his mind disturbed him. And so in his dream, in this vision, in this revelation he's having, he approaches one of those standing there, some divine being, some probably angelic being, and he says, what in the world does all of this mean? Well, he doesn't say that, but I'm paraphrasing. So he told me and he gave me the interpretation. This angelic being, something supernatural has to interpret something supernatural for him. And he says in verse 17, the four great, great beasts are four kings that will rise from the earth. Okay, we could probably guess that. But the holy people of the Most High will receive the kingdom and will possess it forever. Yes, forever and ever. There's some hope for us 
even though these beasts rise as an empire. Then I wanted to know the meaning, Daniel says, of the fourth beast, because it was different from all the others, and it was most terrifying, and it had iron teeth and bronze claws. The beast that crushed and devoured its victims and trampled underfoot whatever was left. This is not a good picture. I also wanted to know about the ten horns on its head and about the other horn that came up, before which three of them fell. Again, you can just imagine rise and fall of kings, rise and fall of empires here. But that horn that I looked at, this horn was, was imposing, was more imposing than the others that had eyes and a mouth that spoke boastfully. And as I watched, this horn was waging war against the holy people and defeating them until the Ancient of Days came and pronounced judgment in favor of the holy people of the Most High. And the time came when they possessed the kingdom. So Daniel is seeing a very disturbing image in his mind here about this fourth beast that is really persecuting God's people. And it isn't until the Ancient of Days God pronounces judgment on them that they actually possess this kingdom. And the angel again says, he gave this explanation. So this supernatural being explains this to Daniel. The fourth beast is a fourth kingdom that will appear on earth. It will be different from all the other kingdoms and will devour the whole earth, trampling it down and crushing it. The ten horns are ten kings who will come from this kingdom. And after them, another king will arise, different from the earlier ones. He will subdue these three kings. He will speak against the Most High and oppress his holy people, and try to change the set times and the laws. The holy people will be delivered into the hands for a time, times, and a half time. But the court will sit, and his power will be taken away and completely destroyed forever. Then the sovereignty, power, and greatness of all the kingdoms under heaven will be handed over to the holy people of the Most High. His kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom, and all rulers will worship and obey him. And verse 28 says, This is the end of the matter. I, Daniel, was deeply troubled by my thoughts, and my face turned pale. But I kept the matter to myself. So if you imagine having this dream, you can imagine it was probably pretty disturbing to see all of this. Now there's a lot going on there. I explained a little bit of it the imagery that's taking place, some of the symbolism. There's a lot of deeper things happening there, but I'm going to summarize everything in this way. There has been a lot of books written about Daniel 7 and Daniel 7 through 12. Books about what all of this means. So Daniel needed some angelic being to interpret it, and now we're trying to interpret what he had to say. And so our interpretation of that basically falls into two categories. There's this Roman view, and you'll see why it's called the Roman view, and there's a Greek view of what all of this means. And so I want to show you these two categories, briefly explain what's going on here, and then kind of jump into what I think it means for us here in the 21st century. So the angel is basically saying these are empires. These are actual empires and kings that are going to rise and fall. And so our interpretation is trying to figure out, okay, who are these empires that are rising and falling? Were they back in Daniel's day? Are they future empires that are rising and falling? Who is this fourth beast? Has he actually been slain and thrown in the fire and judged yet? Or is he still coming it, it, whatever, kingdom, a king, we're not sure. So these are the two ways people view all of this. They're pretty close in terms of how they view these empires, but the ending of that, the last empire, is where they kind of draw some differences. For me, ultimately, you can substitute any of those empires with any of the empires throughout history. Some of them more evil than others, but all of them, in some ways, if they put themselves in the place of God, act more like beasts than royal image bearers of God. And if you think any of these empires are horrible, just start reading some more history, and you can go on through the list of Genghis Khan, Ivan the Terrible, Joseph Stalin. I mean, you pick the century and the time, and you can find a pretty horrible empire. 
And so I'm not as worried about which one is which here as I am about Daniel's overall message of what's taking place here. But these are the basic explanations, interpretations of what's going on within Daniel's dream. We've been introduced to the, the kingdom of Babylon. The Greek view specifically thinks that that first beast is actually talking about Nebuchadnezzar. If you remember Daniel chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar has a dream about this statue, a head of gold, and then it has silver, and then bronze, and then iron, and and as you go down the statue, the type of metal is less precious or as expensive, but it's stronger. And so some of the things being said in Daniel 7 seem to relate to the way that Nebuchadnezzar is described in chapter 2 and how his actual rule and governance is similar to what this first beast looks like. The next is another, the next kingdom on the rise, which is Media, the Medes. They were like the rivals of Babylon, and they differentiate that between Persia and Greece. Now, at the end, you have Rome, Roman Empire, and you also have the Greek Empire with Alexander the Great. And here's where the differences come in, in that the one view believes that maybe this is a reference to the Antichrist, like this fourth beast is still to come. This imagery of it might be within a person. I mean, if you read any apocalyptic stories, there's usually something referenced about the Antichrist. And, well, that's the Antichrist or that's the Antichrist. And people are trying to guess and where he's going to come from or whatever. Or some kingdom that's going to be the Antichrist. But that fourth beast has yet to be slain in that, that view. Whereas in the other view, they believe that it is a reference to Alexander the Great and the kingdom that he set up. Because basically, the world was many different cultures pre-Alexander the Great. And Alexander the Great's empire basically made the world Greek. We call that Hellenism, Hellenistic culture. And that was imposed and enforced on the planet. And this uh, particular king, for about a series of three years, three and a half years or so, severely persecuted the Jews. And the image that Daniel is getting here is, you know what? This exile isn't quite as bad as what's coming. And Daniel is, is prepping those who are reading it for something that is coming. And now we don't have to go too far back in history in our human experience to see some horrible things that have happened within our own world and with our own time. And so really what Daniel is saying here has more to do with the rise and fall of these empires and these empires that really represent more of a beast than royal image bearers when they put themselves in the place of God and the hope that he's trying to instill in his readers that at the end of all of this, God will reign victorious. The Ancient of Days is sitting on his throne. And he will not be overcome. And the, the one like a son of man, as it says here, will rule and reign with him, and all kingdoms and powers will be set before him, and he will have authority over them. Because there may be some dark days ahead. And there were specifically for them, and you can read all about Jewish history, and read how that is a pretty horrible time. You can read human history. We have a very huge problem in our world today called human trafficking. And it happens everywhere. And people are treated like animals and sold like animals. It's happening in our world today. We don't have to go way back in history to see how people, kings, those in power can become more like beasts than like royal image bearers of God. And Daniel is trying to remind us that regardless of the empire that comes and falls, 
And as dark as the days will get for you, as he's telling them, you can still have hope because the Ancient of Days will judge from his throne and they will be slain and he will reign victorious. Daniel 7 is the centerpiece of the book of Daniel. It is building to Daniel 7. The stories of Daniel and his buddies are building to Daniel 7 and coming back out to remind us of where we started in Daniel 1, and we'll see how that works. But Daniel 7 is the centerpiece to show us, I think, and remind us that we are part of a larger story that is taking place. That God is in the process since he decided to work through this one family and said, through you, Abraham, I am going to bless all peoples on this planet. And I am going to begin redemptive history with you and your family. And that's a, a chapter. I mean, you can read those chapters in Genesis, but that's a chapter in redemptive history. And now you and I are part of that redemptive history. We are part of a larger story that I think Daniel wants to remind us of. Don't lose sight of that. Because it can be very easy to get some blinders on and think that this is it. That history began the day that you were born. And there's not this whole big long story leading up to the one that you're involved in. And that the struggles and conflicts that we have are actually a part of this greater story that God is writing. Because they are real. Now living in our world, in our country specifically, we have a much more naturalistic worldview. A materialist worldview. So we just separate the supernatural from any way of thinking. And I reminded us back in Daniel 1 and 2 that the battle you and I face is not against that individual that you can't get along with, not against that government authority that is making laws we don't agree with. The battle we face is actually a, a cosmic one against principalities and powers is how Paul uses that phrasing in, in Ephesus in the letter that he's writing. But we are engaged in this battle for the souls of mankind. And you better believe that these very beasts that Daniel dreamt about are still trying to devour God's people today and turn people away from him. And, and you don't have to watch the news long to see how that's taking place. But Daniel's trying to tell us, rather than live a life despairing of what's taking place, in spite of our present circumstances, despite of everything that's happening around us and being downtrodden about it and saying, woe is me about it. Daniel's trying to see, to tell us to see a larger story that God is writing. That we have to be careful that we don't become so self-absorbed in our own story that we don't see God is using us as a part of his redemptive history. And Daniel's trying to help these people who are struggling. They're in exile. To see themselves as serving something larger than just their individual life. And that's difficult for us because it's very easy for us to get self-absorbed. There's a, a, a term that didn't even exist before that now exists as a result of having something like this. You know, this nice little phone. Back in the old days, when you took a picture with a camera, did you ever turn the camera around and take a picture of yourself? Like when you used a legit camera that wasn't the size of this, it was always to take pictures of other things, other people. And now we build these things. There's a camera looking at me right now. And I can turn this on. And all I got to do is swipe my phone. I swipe it, and let's see. Ugh. Oh, yeah. There I am. And I can just look at myself and take a picture, and hey, there's all you guys, and here, I'll take a selfie right here. Uh, there's, and here's my supper, and I'll take a selfie of my supper. 
we have a term called selfie. That was the word of the year, I think, in 2013 or something like that. You know, Oxford Dictionary does the most searched, most used word or whatever. Selfie was the word that didn't even exist in terms of picture taking before these things. And sometimes we get so caught up in our own story, we lose the sense that God is using us. God is using his church to write a bigger story. He's been writing it since Abraham. When he says, here is what I created. You are going to bear my image. And we are going to be in this perfect relationship. And we know that that ended. That was separated. Because humans put themselves in the place of God. And from that moment forward, God was bringing about redemption. To bring his creatures, in fact, all of creation back to himself. And you and I are living out that story right now. And though we face these conflicts, our story is much bigger than the daily battles that I'm in. Because actually God is writing redemptive history through us. And through your life, somebody else might come to bow the knee and confess that Jesus is Lord. And the kingdom of God advances ever so slowly in their life and in their family's life and ever so slowly changes the world in which we live. God is, through, I believe, Daniel, reminding us of this larger story. And I think what Daniel's trying to bring out in this vision, or at least what God is giving Daniel in this vision, as this son of man who is going to come, And Jesus tells his disciples, I will never leave you nor forsake you. It's better that I go so that I can send the comforter, the advocate, the encourager, you name it, give you my Holy Spirit so that when you are waging this war, you can do that with courage, confidence, and hope because you're not fighting it alone. But I am with you. God goes before us. God is there with us. God is behind us. Trying to remind us that this kingdom that God inaugurated through His Son, Jesus Christ, will advance. And that advancement begins in our life. And yours and mine. When I decide to follow Him. But we better believe that there is a battle raging, taking place all around us, that we are going to need to be reminded of this hope that Daniel offers. And so that ought, to, that ought to influence our attitude when we face the challenges that we face. That ought to influence the way that we live our life. Not one of despair, but we can actually, in spite of our present circumstances, live with joy and hope. Because of what God has done in Christ. We fight our battle. Not with violence. We don't fight that battle shouting over our enemies. Cutting them down. Going onto social media and making tirades about them. And gossiping about them. And hurting them in some way. We fight our battles with truth and goodness. And righteousness. And that's super important because even within our own country, this is taking place all over the world. It wasn't in Dan- just in Daniel's day. There are believers who are gathering in a thing they call a church, might have bricks like ours, might be mud huts, which I've been in in Liberia, might be made of some kind of cobbled together stone, might be some bamboo, but they call it a church and they gather there. Under threat, believing that if they are caught, the government will come and do horrible things to them. This morning in California, there's a group of people going to church. And that group of people was was told before they entered the church building that if you come this morning, you will be charged with a misdemeanor for coming into church and singing and gathering in this space. 
That's happening in California. Because they're breaking some rules regarding COVID. They have been told that you cannot gather in a place called a church. Nor can you sing. If you do that, you will be charged with a misdemeanor. And so people today, this morning, gathered in churches in California may be charged with a crime for gathering. Now, whether you think that's right or wrong with all the COVID response, whether they should be doing that or shouldn't be doing that, they are followers of Jesus in their church. Their pastors say, this is what we're called to do. And they've made that decision. So everybody that gathers, because of that decision they've made as a church, they face that kind of threat. It is happening all around us. We are being challenged as God's people. The empires, they come and they go. And while they're here, oftentimes they take the form of beasts instead of bearing the royal image. And you and I have to decide whose kingdom are we a part of. I want to see people come to know Jesus. And more than that, I want to see those people that come to know Jesus give their allegiance to him and only bow their knee to him. And in our world, Daniel is reminding us, maybe we've been lulled into kind of a sleep, a, a fog, a haze, that this has been going on all around us, all over the world, and we maybe didn't even see it taking place. And now if you live in one of the states and our United States, and other states are like this, and you gather. Because of COVID, you face possible misdemeanor charges. Daniel reminds us that in this battle, in this great big story that God is writing, we're going to need courage and confidence and hope. Because we're going to be facing battles each and every day. And we've got to decide, am I going to allow the rule and reign of God to take place in my life and in my family's life? And if I say yes to that, then I only show allegiance to him. Now, that doesn't mean I don't care about any of this other stuff. That's why I just prayed for our leaders in this country. Because I do care very deeply about the world my children inhabit. In the world their children inhabit. I care about that. But Daniel reminds us that at the end of the age, there is one person that rules, reigns, and stands supreme. And his name is Jesus Christ. And Jesus has said, in the midst of the battle that you're in, I'm never going to leave you. In those darkest valleys, I'll be there with you. And those most difficult times that you face, I'm there beside you. We as the church need to live like that's true and that's real. And when we fight these battles, we fight them representing Jesus. And we fight them using weapons like truth and goodness and righteousness. And we can walk out of this room today with courage and confidence and hope. And we don't need to fear what comes our way. Because we know God reigns victorious. Let's pray. It's 1130. God, thank you for this day. The Sunday morning in which we can gather as your people. God, we live in challenging times. Uh, we live in times in which we need to be reminded of these truths that Daniel gave thousands of years ago. Lord God, thank you that in the midst of history, in the midst of our current story, Lord God, you rule and reign supreme. Father, I pray that the kingdom of God would advance in each of our lives as we walk out those doors and that 
in some small way, with every time we choose to do the right thing, every time we choose to love our enemy and pray for those who persecute us, every time we choose to stand up for what is right and good and true, the kingdom of God advances. And every time another person bows their knee to Jesus, we see your kingdom ushered into another person's life. God, help us to live this life with courage and confidence and hope. Not being afraid. Not needing to fear at all. Be strong and courageous. Do not fear, Joshua was told. Because God goes with us. Because you, Lord, will neither leave us nor forsake us. Thank you for that promise, that truth. May we live that way each and every day. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.